Welcome everyone to another edition of the Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. Today, as I said, we have Stan Silverman, who's been my mentor for over 30 years, so Stan probably doesn't want to admit to that. But when I started and ran the Eastern Technology Council, I once wrote a column in our national publication that mentioned five companies I felt were letting down the region by not joining the ETC. And one of those companies was PQ Corporation, where at the time, Sam was the present chief operating officer, but not the chairman CEO. And all of the companies on the list were upset about outing them in such a public way. But Stan was nice enough to call me and tell me there was a better way to lead to get results uh, that I desired. And I learned a lot from Stan and I continue to learn a lot from Stan for the next 30 years that I knew him and I was on the board with him uh, at Drexel's engineering school as well. So I'm thrilled to have Stan here. This is a copy of Stan's book, which is really very well done. So Stan, Let's start by you telling us, why did you write this book and why did you become a columnist for the Philadelphia Business Journal? Yeah, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good to see everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, thank you very much, Mark, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, the, the book is titled, uh, Be Different, The Key to Business and Career Success. And it's really a master class on leadership and it focuses in on why companies and how companies should be different uh, and achieve the position of being the preferred provider of product or service to the marketplace, which I believe is the holy grail of every business. You always want to be the preferred provider of a product or service to your market so that the people in that market buy from you and not your competition. And the book teaches that. The book also teaches how all of us, as we rise up through our careers, uh, can and should be different than our peers. So we get the next promotion or the next job um, externally to the company. So why did I write the book and why did I become a, a columnist? Oh, about six years ago, I was rotating off as the chairman of the College of Medicine at Drexel University. And I thought about all of my career and everything that I've learned actually serving in the trenches all over the world, building uh, the PQ Corporation, serving on all kinds of boards, public company, private company, private equity company, trade association boards. And I'm thinking, I really need to share my experiences and my knowledge with folks so that they can help them, so I can help them be successful. So I started to write for the Business Journal. Every week, I write a column on, uh, on leadership and this past week, I hit column number 300. So uh, it's quite an achievement, personal achievement for me. And two years after, into that, into that gig, uh, they promoted me to national syndication columnist. And so I now write for not only the Philadelphia Business Journal, but also for 43 affiliated business journals across the, uh, across the country. And as I was writing my columns, I was encouraged by so many people, you've got to write a book, you've got to write a book and put this down on paper so that there's another channel for people to, to understand and to learn uh, what your experiences have been and what you're teaching. So that's why I started, that's why I wrote the book and the book is now out uh, five months. Congratulations, always hard writing, you, uh, writing a book. I've, I've written uh, six of them and they're worse than childbirth, I think. Uh, it takes like <laughs> nine months or more to write one of these books. So Stan, let's talk about uh, your book in sections in a sense, leadership. In your book, you have a profile of what an effective leader looks like. How does one develop into a successful leader? Well, through my experiences, uh, both as both rising up through PQ Corporation, but also uh, serving as its CEO, uh, sitting on the board of PQ and also sitting on the boards of numerous other companies, uh, observing other CEOs and observing other leaders of those companies. I think the key, the number one thing I always say uh, to be a successful leader is you got to have great tone at the top and you have to nurture the right culture. Tone at the top and culture. And if you look at the companies that have failed and you look at the companies that appear in the newspapers under not so uh, stellar uh, circumstances, it's always a failure of tone at the top, and it's a failure of the culture that they have within the company. And if we, have, if we had hours to do this, I could explain two or three, I'll give you two or three examples, but we don't. Um, the, the other thing a leader needs to do, a great leader needs to do, is earn the trust and respect of their employees. If they don't have the trust and respect, nothing's going to happen. Uh, the, the company will not achieve what they're capable of achieving, 
and eventually the board will replace that leader. So if you don't earn the trust and respect of your people, uh, you're not going to be you're not going to be successful. Um, the other thing a leader needs to do is listen to bad news and never shoot the messenger. We have so many leaders out there that basically send signals to their people that, you know, don't tell me this or, you know, I, I don't want to hear this, go away. And you say this once or twice and you basically shut off all communication from ever, forevermore with that individual. And it's a real, uh, uh, it's a real signal for future disaster. Uh, we can all look at the Challenger disaster that happened uh, back in the 80s when the Challenger blew up and NASA didn't listen to the experts from Firecall that told them that uh, the ambient temperature was too cold to launch the shuttle and the O-rings would fail and they launched and they lost the and So you always need to listen to your people and listen to your experts. You have to hold people accountable for results. You never, never want to micromanage folks. Uh, what you do is you hire the very best people you can, make sure they're capable of doing the job or they have the potential of doing the job, give them the resources, tell them what your expectations are, and then just cut them loose. Cut them loose to do their thing. If you micromanage them, they're never going to grow, and it's not your job to do their job. If they can't do their job, you got to replace them with people that can, that have the ability to do that. You only also want to help people develop a sense of ownership in what they do at the company. And I learned this from an hourly employee at our Toronto plant when I was president of our Canadian company. And um, he taught me this by us giving him the responsibility for expanding the capacity of his unit. And he chose a mechanic in the plant to help him, who was the absolute worst person in the plant with respect to labor management relationships with the very best mechanic we had. And after they achieved the expansion, uh, they basically changed, both of them changed and I changed also. Uh, we had this, this individual uh, who was a, a negative opinion leader in the plant telling people now that management trusted me for what I could do with my, with my mind in addition to what I could do with my hands. That's such a fundamental change in an individual. And the, uh, the operator of the plant, of, of the unit, who we gave the responsibility to expand, uh, basically took ownership. Because we gave him ownership and responsibility to expand the unit, he now had ownership of the unit. And right after the expansion, for months and months and months, he made improvements and implemented ideas that we would never thought of. Uh, because we gave them a sense of ownership. So when you give people a sense of ownership, great things will happen. Uh, you never want to tolerate a tyrant reporting to you. Uh, I reported to one. Uh, he basically destroyed the organization that he led. I got promoted around him when I went to Canada. Three years later, I was promoted to be his boss and I fired him. I had to hire the very, very best leader I could to turn that unit around. It was like six months before these people started to make decisions again and the division started to grow. So it's really important that you don't tolerate a tyrant. And of course, uh, you wanna treat people like you would like to be treated. It's the golden rule. You wanna treat them with respect. And if you do that, you're gonna be an effective leader. So Stan, what, how would you characterize your leadership style? Well, I, str I strive to do everything I've just described. Um, I'm not perfect at it, but I'm on a journey. I think all of us are on a journey. All of us are, are, are on a journey to be uh, effective and great leaders. And sometimes you miss, and sometimes you remind yourself that, hey, you don't want to do that again. And so if we're all on a journey, we're never, we never stop on a plateau. We keep on moving forward. And the best person to, of course, ask what kind of leader I was, you ask my direct reports, and they'll tell you. It's not for me to tell you. It's for them to tell you. But I'm always on a journey to be an effective leader uh, just with the traits that I've just described. Was there any leader that you met that you kind of modeled yourself after? Well, as I, as I was coming through the company, I modeled myself um, uh, with uh, many, many effective leaders within our company. Uh, I also knew not to model myself against the tyrant I reported to. I learned a lot from that individual. Uh, a lot of people left. They went to work for our competitors. I was able to find a way to manage this, uh, my relationship with this guy. 
And so, you know, as we go up through our careers, I think we, uh, we, we adopt and we attract mentors and then we move on to the next level and then we have different mentors. So I think that's also a fluid thing. I think we all grow as our mentors grow, our relationship with mentors grow also. In your book, you have a, a chapter entitled, In Business, Good is the Enemy of Great. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm sure many of you read uh, Jim Collins' iconic book, Good, Good to Great. And the first six words in that book are, good is the enemy of great. Good is the enemy of great, which means that if you think you're good enough, you'll never be great. And you're always on a journey to become great because your competitors are on the journey to become great. And if you're not on that same journey, they're gonna catch you and they're gonna kill you. So you always wanna be on a journey to be great. And when I became CEO of the company, uh, it was in January of 2000. And I was CEO for five years. So I finished up in February of 2005. Well, during that time, uh, we had the horrible recession in 2002. And during that period, of, except for the first year that I was CEO, and I basically wrote everything I could off the balance sheet and took the earnings down to zero. Um, we moved from um, $14 million per year earnings level to $43 million per year. I didn't do that. Uh, the men and women around the world that ran our, our divisions in the 19 countries that we operated in did all that work. All I focused on was tone at the top, culture, strategy, and putting the right person in the right job, or as Jim Collins would say, the right person on the, butt, on the bus. And so you always are on a journey to be great. And as we were going through these years, we, during the recession, we never had a down quarter. We never had a down quarter. And so I had one employee come up to me one day, and then I had another one do the same thing about a week later. And they would say to me, they said to me, Boy, aren't we a great company? I said, we are not great. We're pretty good here. We're still working on this, but we're on a journey to become great. Because I think once you tell your people that you are great and they think you're great, there's no place to go but down. And so you always want a journey to be great. I think it's a mistake. I know other CEOs will disagree with me. I think it's a mistake to tell your people that or to claim you're a great company because you plateau and you stop becoming great and you slip the other way. And I think so, champions always think that though, Stan, right? Like I'm Michael sorry. Jordan, there was never sorry. a time, you know, champions always think that they're good, but not great. You know, that's right. why, what drives them. I mean, if you watch the series on Michael Jordan, there was never a time that he thought there was enough practice, that even after practice, he would take 500 more shots. Um, same thing with Kobe Bryant. Same thing with uh, on football, where Bill Belichick would keep running these plays over and over and over again, even though nobody could break those plays down. Uh, the defense had a hard time with those plays. So John Chambers, a former chairman CEO of Cisco Systems, was on last week to promote his book, Connecting the Dots. And John said that the success of a company is more about the culture of the organization than the leader. How does the leader influence the culture to attract and retain the best people and other companies want to do business with it or even be acquired by it? Well, I agree with John Chambers about culture, but of course I would also add tone at the top, which I think is extremely important. Uh, and so both of them play together. And so, you know, everything the leader does, everything the CEO does is watched uh, like a hawk by all the employees in the company. And so you, the CEO sets the standard of behavior and how you relate to each other, how you relate to customers, about the ethics of the company, which are extremely important. And everybody's familiar with the uh, Wells Fargo scandal, which probably cost them $50 billion. Uh, uh, when they were done. Everybody's familiar with, the, with the, uh, the, the Volkswagen scandal, which probably cost them $80 billion uh, when all was said and done. And so it tone at the top really describes the ethics and the integrity upon which you're going to operate your company. Culture is how you're going to deal with each other. And so as a leader, and I had this problem, everybody has this problem. I had people within my organization that were basically backstabbing other people. I got rid of them. They're gone. They're out. I don't tolerate that at all. I don't tolerate tyrants. I don't tolerate toxic people. I don't tolerate people that are not good team players. 
I don't tolerate people that don't help their peers be successful. And so if you set that dynamic up, you're going to attract the right people and people get the idea that, well, if the CEO doesn't tolerate it, I'm not going to tolerate it also. And that's how you build a great organization. And that's how uh, you become an organization that generates great results that will attract acquirers. You know, when I was younger, and I'm 59 now, uh, CEOs were all powerful gods. And people had very little choice about where they were going to go. Because if you grew up in a small town and you worked for the steel mill, it's really the only option that you had. But now, because of the internet and globalization of business, employees have choices. And, uh, and maybe with the exception of a pandemic, what skills would tomorrow's leaders need? So today, how do, how, what skills do today's leaders need? Well, I, I think they need a global outlook. They need to have um, respect for other cultures. They need to benchmark other countries and what people are doing around the world. They need, you know, we, we say that we believe in American exceptionalism. Well, yeah, at one level we do, but quite frankly, people around the world are doing great things also. So we need to benchmark what they're doing and we need to, to take the very best of, of what people do and the best practices and adopt those. We need to operate in a world where uh, we're comfortable with uncertainty, volatility, complexity, and ambiguity. The acronym is called VUCA. It was an acronym that was developed by the military back in the early 1990s in terms of them completing uh, successfully their mission around the world. And so we need to, we need to understand that ideas come from everywhere and we need to adopt them. Uh, if they're appropriate for our company, and we need not to be so U.S. centric. And Andy Grove said something that really stuck with me, and I'm sure stuck with many of you. You need, you need to be paranoid, because only the paranoid survive. But we got global competition out there, and quite frankly, only the paranoid survive. There's a lot of companies that were household names back in the 70s and 80s, and they're dead today. They're dead today. And so you always need to be, you always need to be paranoid. I started out um, using a BlackBerry when they first came out back in the 90s. Everybody was probably using a BlackBerry at the time. They owned the worldwide market for this type of, of email, secure email communication. And because of their hubris, they got killed by, by Apple and by Android because they didn't change. They didn't change. They had hubris and hubris killed them. And so that kind of um, uh, attitude an outlook by a CEO today will get them killed and get their company killed. Stan, outside of Wall Street, it seems to me that finance people are the worst people to put at the CEO level because they never like to spend any money to keep innovating. Uh, and so that to me seems to be one of the things that uh, a lot of companies just don't move forward. I mean, they have to basically look at their own model and say, somebody's going to destroy it. We might as well destroy it before they do, or, or we need to keep putting money into good innovation. So let me ask you about employees. Many people listening are entrepreneurs having to put together a team. What traits should a startup look for as the business grows? And what do you look for when you're hiring people? Well, I've served on the boards of a number of startup companies. So I've seen, uh, I've seen how they work. I've also coached and counseled a lot of entrepreneurs at Drexel University at the Close School of Entrepreneurship. And what I, what I look for, and by the way, I was not an entrepreneur, okay? I came up through corporate America. I am not, I was not an entrepreneur. But knowing what I know today and coaching and counseling today's entrepreneurs, I would tell them, you got to hire people that are not afraid to try something new and are not afraid to fail. And in too many established corporations, people are afraid to try something new because if they fail, they think they're going to get fired or demoted. That's, that's very bad because you don't innovate and you don't move forward. You need to also have to hire people that can recognize that they're heading down a blind, a blind alley and will pivot when they think that the strategy and the direction that they're going in isn't going to work. So you need to pivot. Every successful entrepreneur knows how to pivot. They also not, need to know how to take risks and they need to know how to de-risk their business. They need to know how to, to risk their decisions. And I always say, I always say to this to people that I talk with in coaching council, if you have 100% of the authority to make a decision, and that decision is your decision, but you're concerned 
that the decision has risk and you want to flush that risk out with somebody, it's okay to talk to people about making the decision. Some people think it's a weakness to do that. It's an absolute strength. It is a strength to talk to other people and get other people's views. And people that think it's not a strength and don't ask other people's opinions and then go and fail and they cost the company tens of millions of dollars because they didn't get the right input. Well, that's not, that's not very good. Excuse me. That's not, that's not very good. So you want to hire people that kind of always will ask other people's opinions. You also want to ask people, have people that say, is the benefit of what I am developing as an entrepreneur sufficient to convince the marketplace to change from their incumbent provider or whatever they're using today to my product? Uh, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and the first question I say to them is, why, why will people buy from you? And they kind of look at me, oh my God, that's a really great question. Well, why will people buy from you? Well, people will buy from you if they think that your innovation, your product, your service is so much better than what they're using today, they're willing to take the risk and spend the money to convert over to what you're doing. So you need to people to, to recognize that that's really an important thing to ask when you're, when you're an entrepreneur. Uh, you also wanna hire people that are already afraid to do multiple jobs. Uh, when you're a startup, I mean, you're going to be doing everything. You're going to be working 18 plus hours a day. What you don't want to do is hire uh, a, a manager uh, or a leader, quote unquote, who basically wants to hire people below them to do the work and they're the ones to manage. That only works in big corporations. When you're an entrepreneur, everybody does everything and you're going to be working day and night, except for the time you're going to sleep and you're going to eat. And so that's what I would uh, counsel people who are starting businesses up in terms of what kind of qualities they should hire in people. Stan, since you worked your whole life in a large corporation, what did you learn that surprised you when you work with entrepreneurs? Um, it became very apparent to me that the bureaucracy in my own company, and in fact, I'll admit it, some of the bureaucracy that I, laid, I, I overlaid in my company uh, really killed innovation. Um, and so I am of the reverse point of view today. You know, of course, I don't run a big company. I don't run a global corporation operating in 19 countries where you need some bureaucracy or else you have nothing but chaos. Uh, and that's an issue as companies grow, obviously. But you, you really want to make sure that the, the, the people in the front lines, the people that are developing products, the people that are actually building or manufacturing the products, the people that are providing the service aren't encumbered with bureaucracy. We have too many companies today where the staff groups control what happens in the company. And they basically think they're the boss of the line people. I completely reject that. I completely re reject that. The line people run the business. The staff people are there to serve the line people. If the staff, if the line people don't accomplish their results, you get rid of them and get somebody else. But you don't want the line people to over or micromanage the, uh, the staff people to micromanage the line people. And so I'm of that view today, even though I must admit I didn't practice that as I was coming up through my company. I, I didn't practice that. Did, did you wish you now. Do you wish you would have started as an entrepreneur first and learned all the skills that entrepreneurs learn and then work for a big company? Well, when I got my chemical engineering degree at, PQ, uh, at Drexel University, then to work, and then I went to work for a refinery in South Philadelphia, uh, uh, Arco Corporation, and then I went to work for PQ Corporation. That was my career path. And so entrepreneurship wasn't really popular at the time. If I were to start today, I would definitely go the entrepreneur route, or I'd become a computer engineer, you know, a, a, a systems engineer, one of the two. But that those those alternatives weren't open to me today. And I get so much pleasure out of coaching and counseling entrepreneurs. And so I'll give you a great example of, of my aha. So I, every year, uh, Donna D. Carlos, who was the Dean of the Close School of Entrepreneurship, runs Startup Day at Drexel. And for one day, they have maybe 30 or 40, sometimes more entrepreneurs pitching their uh, ideas uh, to folks, they have contests where we, where she awards prizes for the best ideas. And so when you walk around the floor and you talk to maybe 25 or 30 entrepreneurs and you ask them about their business, you know, it, 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 
the next morning, actually, I got up and I thought about what I, what I just went through. And I said, you know what? We are teaching these young kids who are undergraduates in a real world using real money, either their own money or their parents' money, or maybe some of the money awarded by the, uh, by the close school to them so they can develop their ideas, to develop their ideas, to, to pick partners, to hire their first employees, to deal with customers, to deal with lawyers and accounts, to set up their companies, um, to know when to pivot when their idea doesn't look like it's gonna work and they gotta come up with a new strategy and the next day they do. They are learning all of the skills that a CEO needs to, to successfully operate your business. So I wrote an article that week and the article was entitled, if you wanna become a CEO, learn entrepreneurship skills. And so in that article, I said, you know, these kids who are learning by doing versus the kids who are sitting uh, in a classroom learning off a, a whiteboard and maybe learning some, some of these concepts through lectures and through books and through articles, these kids are actually doing it. That's the kid I wanna hire. I wanna hire the kid that's actually done it. The kid that's failed, but they got up the next morning and ex accepted the failure and said, you know what, I'm gonna move forward. And, I've, and, and as I look back on my career at PQ, I hired kids right out of the best business schools. Well, you know what? All they want to do is hire people below them to do the work. They never lasted, by the way. I, I don't think there's one, there, in my company, there was probably not one Ivy League school graduate that lasted more than a year or so because they don't get their hands dirty. I want somebody, I want a scrappy kid that's, that has failed before, that's tried something, that knows how to accept failure and move on because they're the ones that are gonna be successful. They're the ones that are gonna be successful. So Stan, as organizations grow and end up attracting people who want to keep the status quo, that happens a lot in, in large organizations. They're afraid of change and risk adverse. Often these big companies like Wine Laboratory, Sears, General Electric, either disappear or go from being A-listers to afterthoughts. How can a CEO keep this from happening? Yeah, that's really a great question. Uh, and it's an important question for all CEOs. So how do you keep yourself revitalized and revitalize your company? Um, number one, I think it's, it really starts with the tone and the culture that the CEO sets. You wanna have people who number one are hungry, that wanna accomplish something. You wanna, as I said just a few moments ago, you wanna tell them what your expectations are, make sure they have the resources to do what they need to do, cut them loose to do their thing. You want them to have time outside of the budget to innovate and just to think. A lot of companies kind of control what their developers and what their, their people in R&D do by you know, almost to the dollar where you're gonna work on this project and we'll approve this project. And then if it fails, we're gonna approve another project. I think some of the R&D people need to have the ability to say, you know, 10 or 15% of my time, I just wanna think and kind of work on things. And, you know, don't expect anything out of that, but maybe, you know, out, out of 50 things that are tried, you have a winner that makes you a couple hundred million dollars. And so you need to give people the freedom to think and to innovate. And you need to encourage that as part of your culture. You need to hire people that are like that. You don't want to hire people that are not like that. Um, and I know it's hard to differentiate and sometimes people change while they, well, as they're working for the company, they get nice and, nice and cushy in their job. And you need to rotate people around. You don't want to keep people in the same job for too long because they get used to it. You want to give them a little bit of challenge and a little bit of risk and move them around. It will help develop them as an individual. You want to help them get out of their comfort zone. You don't want people who are always within their comfort zone within the company. That's bad. Get them outside the comfort zone. Let them try new things. It'll help develop them and it'll move your company forward. It's funny you mentioned about thinking. Uh, I. Uh, when I started and ran the Eastern Technology Council, I worked for Hubert Schumacher, who built Senecor and sold it for over uh, $4 billion. And Hubert insisted that I spend one day a week, preferably Friday, uh, not doing anything but thinking and reading. That's it. He said, I want your computer off. I don't want you reachable. I just want you to go read magazines like Inc. and Fast Company and Business 2.0 at the time. And I want you to study other industries. And then I want you to think about ideas that you want to implement in your business. He said, because if you spend every day just working and you're not reading and, and experiencing and, and learning from other people, 
you're not going to be able to grow this organization and never reach its maximum potential. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Is there any CEO that you see is doing this the right way? Is there anybody that you see um, that all of us might be familiar with that you think is doing a great job at this? Well, I can't name any, any offhand because a lot of these folks are in early stage startups and they're always thinking and they're always developing new ways of doing things and they're being very creative. But not and any so of the large you, companies, like any of the companies we're familiar with, do you think that they're really doing a good job of keeping their people not only motivated, but keeping them uh, continuing to innovate? Well, the, the, the companies you think about, you know, obviously they're the, the IT companies, right? You have Apple, you have Google, uh, you have Microsoft. And, you know, you hope that they're doing that, but you get reports from these employees that you know, they're very regimented and they're under control. And so you don't really know what the truth is. So for these people, for these companies to move forward, they've got to create, they've got to create time where they can do that. I got to believe, I'm a real fan of Apple since I moved from, <laughs> I, I adopted the iPhone back in 2010. It was all very, actually late, but I was waiting for, I, I didn't really trust it until I, I felt comfortable with it. But Apple has been so creative in bringing in devices They've got to have people that do nothing but think about this stuff all day. And they give them time to think about this stuff because if they were regimented, they couldn't do their job. So yes, I think Google is probably another company that, that is in that, that situation uh, where they create, they must create time for the people to think. Yet when you read reports by Apple and Google people, it's not so complimentary. So I'm not sure what the truth is. I'm not sure what the truth is. So let's talk about innovation. How do you create a culture of innovation? Well, I think we've covered a lot of that in the last couple of moments. Um, you, need, you need to give people freedom to think and you need to hire the right people who will think. Um, and you also need people who are, are, are also sensitive to the marketplace. And I'll, I'll give you a, a real life example. So when I was CEO of P, actually when I was Chief Operating Officer at PQ Corporation, uh, we would do uh, reviews at our lab, R&D lab, uh, every quarter. So I'd go over there and listen to our folks talk about the great things they were working on. And so I'm sitting there one day, and one of the researchers were telling me about this great uh, invention, this great product that he was working on that would replace uh, the incumbent product in the marketplace today. And so I asked him, I said, well, have you worked up the numbers in terms of uh, how much, what, what is the benefit of the product you're working on versus what's out there today? He says, it's twice as good. I said, great, it's twice as good. Um, tell me, have you worked up the economics, figured out how much it's gonna cost and to get a return on investment, what are you gonna to have to sell the product for? Well, we're gonna to have to sell the product for about twice as much. I said, okay. Uh, so let's go through this for a moment. So you're now the customer and you, you know, you visit, you visit a, a customer and the customer kind of is, sees you come in and the customer hears your pitch and they say, you know, tell me, why should I buy a product that's that costs twice as much, but only gives me twice the benefit for me to switch over? I need three to four times the benefit or else I'm not going to take the time to do it. I got too many other things to do. And so all of a sudden, the researcher, researcher said, oh my God, you're absolutely right. I haven't thought about that. So I want people who are very innovative and creative, but also are sensitive to how to get their product into the marketplace and what the economics are. And there's not very many, that do, there's not very many people that do that. So you have to train them. You have to educate them within your company that that's what they have to do. Where did you get your products from at PQ Corporation? Were they all developed in-house or did you also work with people outside and acquire them? How did that work? Uh, it depended what business we were in. Uh, we were in four or five different uh, distinct businesses and uh, we both acquired technology on the outside. Uh, we developed in-house our technology and um, we also um, basically developed technology from uh, from our history, we'd go back and say, you know, this product wasn't fully developed. Maybe it's something we ought to look at today. And sure enough, we had a couple of wins in that area. One thing we really did well, we really did well. We had great zeolitic catalytic, catalytic uh, technology using our zeolite products. And so 
we developed a product internally along with Shell Chemical. So we joint ventured with Shell Chemical, which of course is part of the Shell organization. And we developed products which replaced the catalyst and hydrocrackers around the world. And Shell had about seven or eight of these things, these units. And so the products we developed, we tested out in their hydrocrackers and then we took the data, the performance data, and then we went to the marketplace. And within four years, we became number one um, uh, provider of hydrocracking catalysts to the marketplace in the US. And over the years, we developed a very strong position worldwide. So we developed internally, but we also leveraged our ability to joint venture the knowledge, to, to use the knowledge of our joint venture partners. And so that worked out very, very well. How, how do you make sure you're not taken advantage of in a joint venture, especially for entrepreneurs? They have a real concern that if they work with a large corporation, the corporation will steal the idea or that the corporation will um, work with them, but then make it their idea. How do you make sure you get a fair deal with a large corporation? Well, if you're dealing with a large corporation, uh, you want to have a very strong patent position and you want to have the ability and the fortitude to defend it if, if it's that good. There's some companies uh, that will, in fact, uh, try to work around it or try to steal your ideas and figure that you don't have the fortitude to defend it. So you have to do due, due diligence on the companies you want to partner with. And it all, again, it gets to reputation, which I didn't mention that word yet today, but everything I've talked about gets down to reputation. If a company has a reputation of not dealing properly with uh, their partners, small, especially small partners, you want to stay away from them. Um, and so you want to deal with people you can trust and deal with people that you're comfortable with, but that doesn't mean that it's all going to work out properly. And so as young entrepreneur, uh, you need to be careful. You need to first understand you're going to be diluted down. If you go to a venture firm uh, for money, whatever level it is, whether it's angel investors or VCs or, or, or whatever, um, you know, they're going to give you money, but they're going to want uh, a seat at the board. They're going to want certain rights to your technology. You're going to be diluted down. And so if it's a really great idea, uh, you got to figure out that and think about, am I better off giving up some control to make me a lot richer in the long run, a lot wealthier? Um, and you have to make that decision. Every time you go out, you have to go out for an up round. And people who are entrepreneurs on the, on the, um, on the video, to, on, on, the, on your show today understand what that is. If you're going for an up round, you have much more control about the, the, uh, the terms that you dictate. If you're going for a flat round, uh, you lose a lot of that power and the people investing in you by right are gonna want a lot more control. So I was serving on the board of a startup uh, and they developed software for hotels and motels uh, to run uh, basically the entire operation using a PC. And, uh, we were growing faster than we thought we should grow, or at least I thought we should grow, but we didn't go back and make sure that uh, our technology was very strong. And uh, when we went out for, uh, for more money, uh, the investors dictated the terms and eventually the CEO, the founder, lost control of the company. So you just got to be careful and get a lot of advice from uh, people that you surround yourself with. You, you should have a, an advisory board where you can get advice uh, with experienced people, uh, not your aunts and uncles and friends, but experienced people in the area because they'll give you the right advice. I'm going to ask you a question about that, but I have one more question about innovation before we uh, go into boards and investors. Uh, what type of profile are, are the people you would hire in R&D? What, what do they look like? Did they have to come from the best schools? You know, what did you look like, uh, look at when you hired R&D professionals? For R&D, you say? Yes. R&D professionals? Yeah. Um, first of all, they need to have an inquisitive mind. They need to have a track record of success. And so if I'm hiring them uh, out of school or from another company, they've been in this for a long time. It's something they developed when they were 10 and 12 years old. I want to know what they've done, what their interests are, what keeps, what keeps, their, keeps them up at night, what are they thinking. And I want to know if they have a track record of success. Um, and the type of person that, and they also have to have some practicality, given the example I gave about 10 minutes ago about uh, knowing that you could be developing a great product, but if you can't get it into the marketplace because you got to sell it for twice what the 
what, what, what the incumbent product is, but it's only twice as good, it's not gonna make it. I need a person that can understand that and therefore work around that or, not, or work on something else. So let's talk about boards and investors. When meeting with potential investors, what should be the profile an entrepreneur should look for? I'm just gonna make you louder, Mark. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Yes, yes. Uh, when, uh, when meeting with potential investors, what should the profile of an entrepreneur look, look for? Well, first of all, the entrepreneur has to be comfortable with the people he's dealing with. Uh, there's gotta be chemistry. Um, the people he's dealing with have to understand the process that they're going through. They have to understand that the entrepreneur isn't gonna have uh, bright sunny days every day. There's going to be bad days uh, and they're going to have to understand that they have to ride with that uh, with the entrepreneur and the entrepreneur has to be comfortable that uh, these folks are going to trust their ability to recover. Uh, they want to hire people that can give them advice that can help them with some of the issues I've just described um, because it'll be free advice basically for the price of uh, for the investment they're going to help you succeed. And you also have to, you know, the entrepreneur has to realize that he or she may not be the person that's going to take this company to greatness. They are the inventor. They are the founder. And in fact, their strength is in the laboratory or in getting something out into the product that's not running a big complex organization. And they have to understand that the investor is going to at some point have the right and in fact decide to replace them as CEO. Uh, and that's just the name of the game. And in fact, it's, you're, you're better, your company is better off when you're replaced if in fact you don't have the skills to take it to the next level. So uh, when do good negotiator, what, do, do, what do good negotiators do that makes them successful? Because that's important when you're working on terms with investors. And you talk about that in your book about negotiating. Yeah, well, you gotta understand where your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, um, what you can demand and what you have to give up. You have to understand where your, your bright lines are that um, you, know, you won't cross. It's, it's not a deal, it's a deal breaker. You have, to all under, you have to understand, you have to also understand the other side, uh, what their strengths and weaknesses are and what they want out of the negotiation. And you have to work for a win-win. And so uh, maybe you can give something up that's not important to you but the other side will give up something that's not important to them, that's important to you. And so you also want to come away with a win-win. And I've written a couple of articles about this. I cover this extensively in my book. You, you really, unless this is a one-timer, and even then, where you think you're never going to run into this, this individual again, you want to treat them fairly and right. Because even if you're not going to have an ongoing business relationship, the world is too small. You're going to run into them again and people have long memories people have long memories and so you want to treat people right even if it means to get a deal done giving up something that's not really important to you but it's important to them which maybe lowers your value a certain amount um, i personally have done that because it keeps the relationship uh, on good terms and the other side knows what you're doing also the other side knows you're you're, you're where you are exactly and they will appreciate the fact that you've done that for the, for, the, um, for the good of the relationship moving forward. So you always want to go to a win-win. Actually, you never want to go to a win-lose, even if you never think you're going to see this person again, because you will see this person again, when in fact they may much, be in a much stronger position than you, and you don't want them to have long memories and kind of take it out on you because you didn't treat them correctly. Uh Many entrepreneurs pick friends, lawyers, accountants to, uh, as their board members. What should leaders look for when forming a board? I always think it's bad to pick your accountant, your lawyer. You're already paying for those folks. What do you right. Well, you're, yeah. Actually, I, I don't want my lawyer and accountant to be on the board. Um, board members, good governance says that you shouldn't be doing business with board members. Now, I know it happens all the time. But I'm a fairly strong stickler with, of that. So I don't want accountants or, or my lawyers that I'm paying because you're gonna, they're going to be representing your best interest anyway. You want people that can give you advice. You want people that you can trust. You want people that understand the difference between governance and operations. There are too many people, and I've seen this. I've seen this too many times where a, a startup will put uh, a bunch of people on their boards that have no concept at all of what a board member is supposed to do and they, they get into the government, they get into operations. Hey, 
the best boards will hold will, will hold the CEO accountable for results. And if they think the CEO is not generating the results, they'll get somebody else. That's the job of a board. That's the job of a board. It's not to it's not to micromanage the CEO. So you don't you don't want board members that will micromanage you, which means you need to hire board members with experience. So I don't think you should hire your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your brother-in-law, your sister-in-law, unless they have a track record on the outside of serving on boards and they know what to do. How many board members do you think an early stage company should have? You know, one that's even maybe venture back. What's the maximum number of board members that can be useful to a, a CEO? I think that, well, first of all, I think you want to hire board members that have expertise in various areas so you can tap that expertise. Um, and I don't think there's a there's the right number. If you have too many, the discussions usually are not very productive. And so I find if you have more, if you have more than eight or nine around the table, uh, it starts to becoming, it starts to get non-productive. And so I would kind of cap that at that level, maybe eight, maybe maybe nine at the most. But that again, that's my experience. And by the way, I'm only, I'm only effective on boards when there's not more than nine people. I'm not effective. I've been on boards where there's 10 and 13 people, 10, 12, 13 people. I feel I'm personally not effective. So I'm thinking uh, unless, unless it's a, a, a big um, uh, educational institution or nonprofit, which is governed a lot differently. It's governed through the committee process, which is different. Um, and so for companies that are in business, I would, that's what I would suggest. And you want to hire people with expertise in the areas in which you need the expertise. And, and making sure you have a cross section of women, minorities. Yeah, well, yeah, thanks. Thank you. I didn't mention that. You want to have all kinds of folks sitting at the table because they're going to bring all kinds of great ideas. You don't want people that look like yourself or like yourself. You want different people uh, because they're going to challenge what you have to say and you have to listen and they're going to bring up ideas that you didn't think about because they have, a, you know, they come from different places. That's how you ensure success long term. Yeah, I've, I've been on uh, boards where the uh, CEO wanted to be able to control the board members and one of the board members always to vote in the direction they want. And if the board member fucked them, they ended up being off the board. But I noticed that with all those companies over the long term, they didn't do particularly well. Well, for private companies, uh, that occurs. In other words, if you own the company and you want to hire a board to help you, you have complete complete control over who you hire as a board member. Um, I don't think you're going to be successful if you don't let the board do their job. However, for public companies or big private companies with a large private ownership, uh, you can't operate that way. The board, if they're if they're doing their job, they will do the governance job, which means that they're going to do all the right things. They're going to, they're going to talk to you, give you advice. Uh, and by the way, just because uh, the board uh, opposes something the CEO wants to do doesn't mean the CEO has to resign and leave. My board opposed a couple of things I did. And I took that as, well, you know, they're right. I thought about it. And so a lot of board members are afraid that, you know, if we oppose the CEO, the CEO is going to up and quit. Well, that's not, the kind of CEO that you want. That's not the kind of relationship that you want with your uh, with your CEO and between board members. I think a lot of I think some board members are afraid the CEO will fire them and ask so them to leave the board. Well, first of all, you, the CEO can't unless it's a private company. The CEO can't fire you. And only, most of the, the board members can. Only the other private. board members can. Excuse me. Only the, the other board members can, or the stockholders when they vote. Yep. But most of the companies are listening to this call and most of the people will be listening to this are, are with private companies, whether they have angel investment, venture capital, or, or whatever, but they still form these boards. And, and I guess it's, it's very critical for them to make sure that they don't get yes people that are going to rubber stamp all everything that they do. That, that would be terrible. They're not doing their job. Actually, they're, they're, they're missing a huge opportunity to get a huge amount of input on the direction they need to go and what strategies they should, they should pursue. I always remind uh, CEOs whose boards I sit on that they have all these families are counting on them to make smart decisions. And if they're not listening to other people's viewpoints, they're hurting all the other families who have trusted them, both the employees, the vendors, their clients. There's so much riding on them um, being good listeners 
and being able to take lots of different ideas and, and putting their ego aside. Mm -hmm. CEOs of all sizes of companies right now are struggling. What do you re recommend they do during this pandemic? What would you be doing if you were running PQ Corporation? Actually, I've written a number of articles on this over the past uh, probably six to eight weeks. Um, a lot of companies are struggling. A lot of companies are doing well. But let's talk about the companies that are struggling. I think CEOs need to understand that the world is different. Uh, they need to think about reinventing their business in the appropriate way. They need to understand that they're not going, we're not going to bounce back, we're going to spring forward. Uh, just what we're doing today is going to be a staple of, of, of the world, uh, uh, of world business. Uh, instead of getting on an airplane and flying out to California for a six hour meeting, it's all going to be done by, by Zoom, uh, unless there's a reason to go out. And so CEOs need to understand that they need to reinvent their business and recast it. They need to have perseverance, they need to understand that their people are their best asset to help them do this. They're not gonna do it themselves. They need to understand that the people are hurting, the people are struggling, and they need to have some empathy for their people. Give them some time off. Don't let them burn out. Also, if you have to lay off people, try to do it, well, you always wanna do it in, in a very, very respectful way um, because you want to lay people off the way you would want to be laid off. If you have to furlough people, you do it in the way you would like to, you would like to be furloughed. But things are going to change. Things will change. But you know what? Change is the only constant in life. And so whenever there's a huge disruption, my God, this is one of the biggest disruptions we've ever faced ever, certainly in my career, but I think ever for anyone. Um, change will come out of that. Those folks that can adopt the change reinvent themselves, will survive and prosper, and those that don't, won't. Here's my last question for you, Stan. What books and magazines do you read? You know, or what would you suggest to people? Me, I'm big on Fast Company, Inc. and the Harvard Business Review. And then I'm reading two books a week now that I'm uh, hosting this show. But well, what do you recommend people read? Well, I, I, I read uh, Inc., I read Fast Company, I read Harvard Business Review. I read every periodical I can that's on business. Magazines, I'm constantly reading magazines. I'm constantly uh, going to aggregators <clears throat> who basically ag aggregate uh, articles so I know what the latest thinking is. I read about the latest news. I read a lot about the news because in my business, which is to write columns, uh, actually commentary, uh, on, on business. I got to understand what businesses are doing. And so since I've been nationally syndicated, uh, I've been told by the Business Journal organization that I'm, I'm one of the top, top 10 uh, uh, people that are read with, across the, the country with respect to their 43 business uh, uh, publications. And so to keep fresh, I'm constantly reading about what people are doing right, what people are doing wrong, and I write about that and I, um, I write commentary on it. That's what I do. Stan, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we all appreciate it. Wish you luck with this book and uh, hopefully we'll have you back at some point. Thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate it. Thank you. Everybody have a wonderful day. Bye now.